Welcome to Let Me Know How It Is, a pop culture podcast about animation, TV, movies, comics, and all things geek. On this episode, we'll be talking about all things multiverse. I'm Frank Melman. I'm Zach Slater. And I'm Clifton. So in preparing for this episode, I did my research. I wanted to see if I could tree this back to its source about where the multiverse quote unquote starts. And uh, the earliest if I could find was just so we could get a little bit of an idea of what the concept is. I mean, we're all familiar with it from comics and TV and movies and such. But in case you're un- unaware, I've treated all the way back to about 1803. Okay, wow. And all the, the basically the, the, the idea of the double slit experiment, where basically you watch wave light particles go through. <laughs> okay, yeah. And the idea that, you know, as you watch something, if something is observed, it does not act normally. So therefore, mm. you have the thing where it would either go through the slit or not through the slit as you're watching. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and people speculate that's like the earliest scientifically we could basically tree it back to. Okay. And like I said, that's 1803. Um, uh, the earliest I could find like for story wise though, was um, there was talk that the Romans were the first to basically look at a battle and say, this is how it could have gone differently. And then extrapolate it out further from that. Okay. Hmm. You know, they would look at the basically, you know, run the battle back in their head. Well, what if we had done this, or what if we attacked here, or whatever? Mm. And then the idea being, well, you know, that's just this is what it would have happened. So there's your first ideas of, right. you know, choices affect, you know, how the how the how things unfold. Like as a thought experiment, they they follow that path down into the future to to speculate about what would have been. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of speculative fiction for them, I guess, was just right. a thought exercise of, of of replaying these battles out, you know, out to. What they would be, they imagine to be their logical cause. Like maybe I don't know if it got so involved. Like what if the weather had been different, or if we, you mm. know, someone we had if an illness had attacked. You know, I don't have no idea. I couldn't exactly find um, actual historical proof, but that right. was the idea. Was is is there? Right, ancient Roman. What if? Right, basically. <laughs> but in 1923, uh, an unknown artist, the, uh, an unknown writer that that doesn't get a lot of credit for science fiction stuff, uh, known as H. G. Wells. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I might have heard of him. Yeah, you may have heard of it. came up with a science fiction novel um, that had to deal with a parallel world, and it was called Men Like Gods. Okay. In which um, some English motorists basically drive through an invisible barrier mm. and end up in a world that's a parallel world uh, where it's populated by humans that are known as utopians. Um, yeah, but it's set at a different time. Like I think it's like 3,000 years either in the future or in the past. I have not read this novel. Okay, yeah, I'm not even familiar with that one. But yeah, it looks like it said, uh, set in the summer of 1921, uh, Mr. Barnstaple, or Barnstaple, either Alfred or William Barnstaple, is a journalist working in London. He's kind of um, tired of his life there. But like I said, he just goes, and he goes for a drive and then gets transported to this other thing where there's these earthlings who live in Utopia. So that's one of the early science fiction novels. Okay. It. Is that published posthumously? Um, I don't know for sure. I didn't realize he was around then. Yeah. <laughs> as, as that recent, I should say. I, I, mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. But anyway, um, so along those lines, as we've given a little background, and we can talk more about where, um, where it pops up at the various places that, that in different things. I, my, my, my question for you all is where did you first encounter the concept of the multiverse? Or parallel worlds. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think we're going to use those interchangeably because unless we need to, to, to specifically change, you know, explain why they're not the same, but they're pretty much the same thing. Right. Right. The, I mean, for me, I, it, it had to have been a cartoon. Okay. <laughs> it had to have been a cartoon. I can't, I don't know if I can pin it down other than to know that like, you know, an early eighties action cartoon, it's, it's where it would have had to have been for me. Right. And I brought up one before that I know is, is early and that's the GI Joe mm-hmm. episode. Um, which now I'm blanking on the name of. <laughs> I know, I know the one you're talking about. I don't remember the title, but it, it sounds awesome. <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah, because it's definitely one of those things where you don't. I think we've talked about it before. Was like it's not. It's almost if I remember correctly, like you just it's all the reveal stuff is 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 unknown to you, and it's like oh my god, because again, it's one of the first ones like you see like characters that have died, right. Which is always one of the things of like, oh, well, that was that was a shock because we didn't, you know, everyone parachuted to safety, right? That's usually how that works. <laughs> no one ever, no one ever dies in GI Joe until the movie. 
So yeah, that was, it was, it was, again, it was one of those, it was almost like for, for that show, it was kind of like over the edge for Batman, the animated series where you're like, what is this? Right. Yeah. This is not how the world should be. So we talked about it cause we did an episode on, do we do, we did an alternate realities episode, I think once. Yeah, uh-huh. we did. And, and this, this one did come up in that it was worlds without end part mm. one and two. Mm. Okay. And quick description is that during a struggle between GI Joe and Cobra an accident triggers an experimental weapon. As a result, mm. the Joes are plunged into unconsciousness. When they awaken, the explosion hurls them into an alternate reality where Cobra has defeated G.I. Joe and conquered Ah, the world. There it is. It is a two-parter where uh, they go on to find an unlikely ally Mm -hmm. in the Baroness. Yep. Who has Mm -hmm. turned good in that world and is fighting against Cobra. And then uh, Steeler, the G.I. Joe Steeler. Mm -hmm. Ah, there it in, is. Uh, finds out that in that world he died, mm-hmm. and he's one of the Joes that got taken. Uh, that that goes to that alternate world. It's a good episode. But Sounds great. Mm-hmm. My <laughs> guess yeah. is that that okay. episode is the first one that that introduced me to it. It aired uh, November fourth and fifth, nineteen eighty five. Mm-hmm. Early ones. Yeah, if I had to pin it down to one, I would say it was that. That was probably my first experience with with multiversal stuff. Gotcha. Zach, how about you? Well, first of all, because I was curious, I looked it up. H.G. Wells died in 1946. Yeah, it was World War II. That's that's, that's how long he was around. It's way later than I thought it was. And and, and also... (laughs) Well, he had uh, access to a time machine, so that means nothing, Zach. Which doesn't... which, (laughs) Which doesn't get said anymore. Like, he was alive for the Orson Welles, or in the right. world, he's, he's in the old west, but he's right. alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nuts to me because, because right. you know you never hear that anyway. Um, uh-huh. So yeah, so I, I I've been racking my brain trying to think about what the first one was. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew I knew you were a- asking this question. I was trying to sure. pin it down. I'm 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 with Clifton. I mean, it has to be a cartoon somewhere. I will say this: this is this is kind of an issue I had when we did. Uh, uh, the alternate world, right? Like alternate future episode that we did like way back when we're like, mm-hmm. I have an issue sometimes we're like in my head, like, like dream episodes and alternate future, alternate mm-hmm. reality episodes, like kind of get like meshed together in my head. Sometimes mm-hmm. they but, sometimes right. serve the same story purpose, but they right. are not the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like structurally, they look very similar. Right. Right. And, and accomplish a lot of the same things, but, but yeah. like, in fact, you, know, you brought up many dream sequences in our alternate reality. I did. Episode. I did. And, that, and, and, <laughs> and that's so, so I'm just, I'm putting that out there as a disclaimer that like, uh, I have a blind spot in my brain for this apparently. <laughs> so I was thinking like, it's gotta be a, a cartoon, but then I ran into that same thing. I was like, no, that's a dream episode. That's a dream episode. This doesn't count. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think honestly, I mm-hmm. think back to the future too. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's one where like they never say like multiverse. Right. No. That, right. But right. it's but it's there. Right. Mm-hmm. It's alternate, alternate timeline. Yeah. Yeah. It's alternate timeline. But but I mean that's what they're talking about essentially. Mm-hmm. So I th- I think you know unless I'm misremembering I I mean certainly I was one of the earliest. Okay. It was either that or. Mirror, mirror from Star Trek. That's a good one. Mm, we can yeah. talk about that one more too. And and you know, my brother was a big Trekkie, so that's probably how I saw it really young. Mm. You know, and and Spock was always my favorite as a kid, so probably that's why I probably heard somewhere that there was an episode where Spock was a bad guy, right? And I was <laughs> and I was just enthralled with that. Um, how can that be? Right, <laughs> <laughs> right, of course. Right. What? So. I actually like I need a spotter on that. Like I don't I, I haven't watched Mirror Mirror enough to tell you the plot like off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. I know I know that it's Kirk. Uh it's not the whole cast going, right? It's just like three of them going to like an alternate reality, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I don't remember which yeah, it's like I think it's him and Uhura and and one other person, I think. I don't know if it's a red shirt or not. I haven't seen Mirror Mirror forever either. So Okay. But there's been obviously there's been many, many Mirror Mirror episodes and since then dealing with the, yeah. the, the quote unquote evil universe of Star Trek and the, and the, uh, the empire at that point. It did give us, well, I don't know. I didn't research it to that degree, but I mean, I feel like the, the, the shorthand 
that they give you with Spock with the goatee. Mm -hmm. We're like same actor looks slightly different take. I Mm -hmm. feel like that that shorthand is mimicked more times than not in, in Mm -hmm. almost every iteration of a multiverse thing we see. Right. right. And certainly became a trope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Community does something with the darkest timeline where they all have goatees. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. You can tell the difference between Abed and evil Abed because of why, because of goatee. (laughs) <laughs> right so that's something that happens i think yeah south park did it early on too with carbon having a goatee and there was a <laughs> fracture between the the two the, the screen so it looked like it was the same actor trying to play opposite sides of the you know the frame right yeah it's got like a split it's got like right. a like a rip down the middle of the screen yep. like they're doing the old-fashioned split screen where yes. they're both like slightly off right yeah exactly <laughs> I try to go T boy. you guys won't remember i try to go to very briefly <laughs> and i and i did it not I go had, well no, but I, I remember I had friends being like, oh, it's Mirror, Mirror, Zach. Nah. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Watch out, everyone. He turned evil. I had gone one Halloween as Kirk, and I shaved, shaved my facial hair and then grew my goatee back. And then now it was, you know, the next year that I wore my, my Kirk outfit, or I was Mirror, Mirror, Kirk. <laughs> double duty. Double right, duty. Got, some, mile, got yeah. some mileage out of that <laughs> costume, of course. Say, yeah. So. Efficient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So for me, I was trying to think about this too, where where it all went back to, because I thought maybe it was Mirror Mirror, and I thought maybe um, there was something animated. But I kept coming back to, there's an issue of Justice League of America. It's like, it's, I looked it up, it's issue 124, um, written by Carrie Bates, who wrote The Flash for a long time. He was, he was um, it says, well, look at this now, it says Carrie Bates and Elliot S. Magan, both of them great writers of the 70s, wrote some great superhero stuff. Penciled by Dick Dillon, uh, inked by Frank McLaughlin, and it's called The Avenging Ghost of the Justice Society. So it's double dips for me. It's not only the concept mm. of uh, parallel worlds or, you know, um, the multiverse. Uh, it also might have been my first introduction to the JSA. Okay. It's a very weird sort of, it starts out on Earth Prime. That's another thing that's got it. I didn't have the first part, but basically Earth Prime in, in DC Comics at that time was where all the comics were written from. It was kind of like the thing with Stan and Jack in the bullpen. Right. That they sort of interacted with the rest of Marvel. But DC had its own thing, where basically Earth Prime was where all the DC writers and artists lived in New York. Um, this has Carrie Bates getting superpowers and ending up on Earth 1 and I think Earth 2. Okay. So there's, so there's a fair amount of, of multiversal gameplay involved in it. And again, it, was, it, it came out in 75, so it's a pretty, like, I remember even as a kid, just it was pretty heady. Like, it was kind of trippy for a kid to be reading. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if I got it new off a newsstand, if it was bought for me, because I would have only been really young at that point, or it was bought secondhand and give it to me. But anyway, that's the earliest I could think of when it's, it's got that introduction of, you know, I had the question of like, why do some of these characters look like other characters on Earth One? Why is there no counterparts for other of these characters? Like, why is there no Wildcat on Earth One? Right. <laughs> you know, why is there no Dr. Midnight on Earth One? Um <laughs> How does Batman? I mean, at that point, I didn't realize there was an Earth Two Batman, or, or the why does the Flash not look like uh, Barry Allen Flash? You know, like all these questions. But that's where I remember it first coming up was that was that that point was was reading that one. Okay, and then going back and then um, you know looking at more obviously because again um, I've talked about this before um, long ago, kids before the days of the internet and the web, when you wanted to know stuff, you had to have somebody who had read all these comics. <laughs> Or you would buy a yeah. comic with as many characters crammed into it as possible so you could at least learn what they did or what their name was or, you know. And a lot of those early comics that I bought were comics that had, you know, the JLA, the JSA, Seven Soldiers of Victory, uh, Freedom Fighters, Legion, big team ups, right? Mm. So I could learn more about the universe. And, you know, that, that extended even further to like DC Comics Presents and, and Marvel team ups so that I would learn more about stuff because there was no. There were no, no, there were a thousand podcasts and websites to give you that information. So, right, and a lot of those stories happen to be um, multiversal or par- uh, parallel world stories. And for a lot of us, you are that person that we ask, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So you didn't have a you, an no, adult you. No, I didn't. <laughs> I had to become the you that I wanted to be yeah. for me. So, yeah, that had to work out that way because I just didn't have the information. And, and then the other thing was there was no like who's who or official handbook of the Marvel Universe. So there was that too that you just couldn't go look it up someplace. 
You know, there was no uh, Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Britannica for superhero stuff. I'm sure there was, but not in my local library. Right. But um, in looking more at the, at more of like the 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 back the background for stuff, I started to look at um. A lot of times it came back also at, along the lines of this 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 uh, observation of these this particle wave. It also came down to Schrodinger, sure, and the Schrodinger cat the Schrodinger cat experience or experiment of, you know, is the is the cat alive or dead in this box, and that the ext- extrapolation became the idea of well that's only two choices right it's kind of binary to only have those two choices there surely had to be you know there could be a million other choices beyond just that and that helped to solidify the idea of the multiverse or um, parallel worlds theory, right? Mm. Interestingly enough, I had always thought that the flash of two worlds, shifting gears, the flash of two worlds, which is flash uh, 123, Mm -hmm. which came out in, let me see, in 1961, which is the first time that Barry Allen and Jay Garrick, those two flashes team up together, right? Right. With the classic cover of them Mm -hmm. running both towards you on one side, each on one side of the cover. Right. Is that that whole thing of like, you know, the idea is proposed that um, all the comic characters from from the Golden Age are comic book characters in Earth One. So those Earth Two characters that had those adventures, like Barry Allen as a kid, read those books, right? Right, right. And it's kind of the impetus where he gets the kind of idea to be um, to be when he gets the super speed powers from the lightning bolt and the chemicals that he's like, well, I'll be the Flash. Like that's what you know, that's what I'll be. It kind of. You know, I don't know if they if they they retcon it. I don't think it's mentioned obviously in in, um, in this origin, but I think you know they thought, oh well, we have these characters in mothballs, we can always use them, and then later say that this was kind of the inspiration as to why he did it. Right, right. He's emulating yeah. his hero Jay Garrick from the comics, right? But I found out in doing my research, doing the homework, that in 1953, good eight years earlier, Wonder Woman issue 59 has the first adventure of a DC character in a parallel world story. Um, Wonder Woman is thrown off a cliff. <laughs> the magic lasso gets struck by lightning as she's falling. <laughs> she finds herself at, transported to a parallel world where she meets a, a woman named Tara Taruna, who's basically a duplicate of Wonder Woman in this world. Okay. So, she, so she's like a variant, to use mm-hmm. the Marvel term. Um, and they team up to fight the bad guy there, and then she returns back to her own universe. Hmm. So eight years earlier, there's something I never knew that this is a story that took place before then. Now, now people say the multiverse, quote unquote, starts with 61. I couldn't find anyone who was like willing to dispute that. Right. Right. But that was the one that I was kind of surprised at the idea of like, oh, there's this whole Wonder Woman story. And the, and right. the thing about it, it's not even like um, they start to, dis- to distinguish Wonder Woman in the comics at some point, the one from Earth 2, the Golden Age Wonder Woman. They sort of give her like uh, gray streaks in her hair, make her look a little bit older than Wonder yeah. Woman. Yeah. Yeah. Like kind of like they do with Superman later. Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. To try to give you an idea that well, no, she's the older one. She's the Golden Age one. But this, from everything the images I could find for the story of with Tara Taruna or Tara Taruna, depending how you pronounce it, um, it's pretty much the exact same. Like whoever the artist was, I guess it would have been at the time, drew exactly the same character. <laughs> you know, and they're talking back. You know, one. You know, it says I'm looking at a panel, and they're together, and it's it's exactly the same. <laughs> The same same outfit, no change whatsoever between <laughs> distinguished between the two. So, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. I never knew that 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 story actually existed. I always thought it was. I've always and I've said it, I think on our podcast quite a few times, and I think it goes all the way back to Flash Two Worlds. Yeah. So, I'm just yeah. hung up on how did she get back? Did she have to fall off another cliff and get struck by lightning again to get <laughs> back? Probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah. They they hooked a they hooked a connecting wire up to the the invisible jet, and yeah, then when 1. they got 21 to one point twenty one gigawatts, yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah, when it struck the clock tower, everything will be yeah. fine. Um, it was quite a scheme to get her back home. <laughs> like that was so complicated how she got there. <laughs> She had to get her mom, Zeus, to go to the enchantment under the sea dance with Poseidon. <laughs> okay, and therefore, it makes sense now. Right, of course, it all it's comes a good together. One. Yeah, it's yeah. a really tight script. <laughs> comes together in the third act really well. But yeah, I, that that was one again. I'd not I'd not heard heard about that before. I was very surprised to hear that when I read that. But again, the one that also people that the people do think of is the one between Jay and Barry the first time they team up. Yeah, which leads to. I believe it's Just League of America number 23. Let me look that up to be sure, make sure I've got that right. I think a lot of people may forget the fact that Flash of Two Worlds has that comic book component to it. Mm-hmm. I know that's not front and center in my memory. 
right. always when I think about it. And I always kind of think of that book kind of fondly as sort of like, you know, Earth One, Earth Two, they come together, right? Mm. And there is a bit of that, but I forget that it was that like Jay existed as a comic book character in Barry's world first. Right. Yeah. It's not just to Barry, comic. it's not just going to another world. It's like it's like holy crap, like I'm meeting Luke Skywalker. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. His character from pop culture is real. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Justice League of America number twenty one. That's the one where they basically crisis on Earth one. It says on the cover, and this is weird, weird to think. It says back after twelve years, <laughs> <laughs> the legendary superstars of the Justice Society of America, Oof. Um, and they team up with the J, the the JLA and the JSA. Team twelve whole here. years. Twelve whole years, right? Yeah, which is again what? So it'd be, it was it was <laughs> August of nineteen sixty three. So they only they hadn't been gone that long, but um, yeah, that's the other, so that becomes an annual thing for a long time. Where those two teams, or them, the Justice League, and another team, or three or four teams, would all team up together in these big uh, two or three issue stories, that kind of became a thing. And like I said, it was one of those things where you know you had subtle differences between the two, and then one year they introduce Earth Three with the evil crime syndicate of America. Ooh, that's Ooh. a good one. It's a great yeah. one. The concept of you know this evil villainous uh, group that basically are mirror images of our of our heroes. But yeah, this goes on for a while, and it's one of those things where eventually, um, and I say eventually as it takes place, like we just talked about, that was 63, eventually this becomes a thing that just sort of continues to grow and expand as a concept, where you have stories that are set on Earth 2, is set on Earth 3, uh, eventually when they acquire um, Captain Marvel Shazam, that's Earth S, um, <laughs> right. you have Earth X. No, not not the Marvel one, but the one where the Freedom Fighters are still fighting the Nazis because they won World War II. Right. Um, so on and so on and so on, right? There's Earth was Earth Seas, I think the Captain Carrot in this amazing <laughs> crew world. I could go on for a while. But again, all this stuff starts to be DC's multiverse, right? This becomes a thing. And eventually, you know, people I don't know if, if editorially it was a push or it was fandom that was a push, but somebody was pushing for the idea of like, we gotta clean this up. And it sort of leads into the one of the biggest um, multiversal stories I know of, which is the Crisis on Infinite Earths in '86. Right. Um, you have a pretty good big uh, build up to it in individual books. I think the first appearance of the Monitor is um, like the Losers, one of the Losers issues. I'll look it up real quick. But anyway, the Monitor and Harbinger start to gather um, groups of heroes and villains because they know the multiverse has started to wear down. But that's one that I that I I love. It hit me at the right time in my fandom where I was like, yeah, I was ready for it. Right. I know lots of people my age now who who say it just screwed everything up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I belong to a fair amount of groups that are just like, no, the J, you know, the Just Society alone is one. Just Society and Legion are the two that got totally messed up <laughs> because of trying to compensate for what goes on in crisis. And to an extent, I understand that, but. I don't I don't hate it as much as other people. I happen to I happen to love it quite a bit, <laughs> to be honest. Right. Um uh yeah, so he's shown shown in shadows, the monitor in New Teen Titans volume number one, issue number twenty one in eighty two. And then he's fully seen in GI combat, like fully revealed in where did the issue go? July GI Combat number two seventy four in February of 1985. So it'd be another three years. So they build up the story for, for, you know, good three or four years before they finally got the book out with, uh, Marv Wolfman and the great, um, George Perez. And then inks and, and assists by the end by Jerry Ordway. Um, I love this book. I, I know a lot of people, I know we've got the animated that's, uh, first parts come out and the second parts coming out. When do we know? Pretty soon from this recording. I don't have the exact date. Um, okay. The, the the digital and physical releases and then the, and then the HBO Max stream date like has all confused me on everything. <laughs> okay. so, you know, like it's, but they've just recently they put together like a two parter for it. I've not seen it yet. Has anyone three parter? Seen it? It's gonna be a three oh, is it a three parter? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, so the three parter. Um, has anyone seen the first part? I have not. No, I'm waiting for it to drop on Max still. Okay. Yeah. Clifton, how about you? I've not seen it yet. I didn't even know okay. it was a three parter. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a good one. It's a good again, as a kid who loved um a story with a million characters, it's got them all, baby. Um <laughs> every character that DZ had at that point um is in it. And this isn't their first attempt at adapting it. 
It's true because they did it for the CW, right? right? They did the CW crisis on a few Earths. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty good. It's right. a pretty good for, for for what they've got, what they had. It was pretty good. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun. They did a good job of tying up you know, a lot of their TV, you know, stuff. The other other shows, you know, you know, you got Burt Ward appearance in it, and mm-hmm. and uh, I can't remember the actress's name from Birds of Prey. Oh, Ashley Scott. There yeah, you go, Ashley Scott. Who was Hunter on Birds of Prey, which is so funny because. Black Canary from Birds of Prey was on Batwoman right. at the time. You're right. That's true. And doesn't reprise her Black Canary role no. for a cameo. I thought it was so weird. It is weird. <laughs> it's very bizarre. Because she was all over Batwoman. Right. She was yeah. the co-star of Batwoman. Yeah. So, no, I mean, it was good. I like that. You know, this is the, the animated one, but the 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 original, the Big Magilla, is the one that's got, like, it's everybody. It's from Anthro to, to Commandy, the Legion. Uh, the losers, Sergeant Rock, a uh, whole ton of villains, the monitor, the anti-monitor. It's great. I love it. But again, that's one of those things where it's got it. It is the first. Let's try to clean up our multiverse story that DC keeps, you know, coming back to that well of chasing it. Right. It's like yeah, they let it got it. They let it get out of hand. They realize they let it get out of hand because they had all mm. these different stories where some mattered, some didn't, some were real, some weren't real, some were kind of real. Right. And they decided let's let's fix that up. Mm-hmm. And then that was the first time. <laughs> right. Right. And then ever since then it's been the the ba- the the patch <laughs> to try and fix the mistakes of the last yeah, one. It's sort of a, a vicious cycle of yeah. like, oh, it's too fun not to do that stuff. Oh no, we made a mess again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So but um when I think of multiversal stuff, I think of that's one of the one things I think of. Um Marvel has got their own sort of situation coming up. And we'll, we'll backtrack a bit to talk about their first multiverse story. And then, mm-hmm. but Marvel is it, it, to me was like, it's not their, it's not really their, their stock and trade, the multiverse, at least it wasn't for a long time. Right. I mean, there were obviously multiple multiversal stories, but uh, I looked at it, which I found that again, I was not sure about this one, but apparently in 1962, um, Strange Tales number 103 has Johnny Storm of the Fantastic Four gets teleported to another reality for the first time in Marvel history where he's sent to the fifth dimension. Okay. And then it's not like the, not like Mixie or, right. um, or the band and they're banning the fifth dimension. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Neither one of those. I don't okay. know the story. I, I was unfamiliar with, I don't know the Strange Tales stuff from that time, but that's the first time it, that it comes up in a Marvel story. But then you've got, um, uh, plenty of other stories. I mean, my main, the main standout for me was when I think about Marvel. Also, you know, obviously, Marvel uh, multiversal stuff is what if, right? Right. I mean, that's the yeah. one. That- and like, that's that's kind of the difference. There was there was Marvel multiverse stuff coming out of uh, Alan Moore's Captain Britain. Mm, that's true. Yeah, uh, which is like early eighties mm-hmm. uh, when he was doing it for Marvel UK and stuff. Right, because that's where you get Captain Britain hopping realities a lot Mm -hmm. and then that later came back into play when when uh claremont was doing excalibur right the cross time caper Mm -hmm. stuff was playing off of that early early ellen moore captain britain stuff but yeah what if like marvel didn't seem to linger in a multiverse like dc did they would just like dabble in it right in the form of the what ifs and be like let's let's visit this one for a second and then that was fun Mm-hmm. No, let's visit this other one for a second, and that was fun. But they didn't spend time in the mm-hmm. other realities, really. No, I mean, I remember. I mean, I remember the strike. Like, it's a pretty striking image of what if you know the the what if number one, which is what if Spider Man had joined the Fantastic Four, which goes all the way back to Amazing Spider Man number one, mm-hmm. where you know Spider Man basically swings into the Baxter Building, it's like I'm here, I'm you know hire me, <laughs> cut me a check, I'm ready to be part of this team, and they're like you know uh, you know. Susie, we can't let the you know, Spider Man be part of the team, you know. And then you know, Reed has to explain to them that they're you know they're funded to do scientific stuff, but they're not really a you know they're not a business, quote unquote. Right. But it goes all the way back to that where they kind of like sure, and then they become like the Fantastic Five. Okay. But no, I mean, it, I always liked what if what if is you know is 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 much like the the show that's on Disney Plus, except for the fact that it's not it's it's obviously comic books as opposed to being tied into what's going on in the MCU. But the premise is the same. It's the watcher. Watch who's there, you know, observing, watching things play out in the multiverse. And then pondering the question, what if, you know, for various things. 
do you did you guys read a lot of what if yeah i read probably the what if i don't know if it was like what if volume three i lose track of how they mm-hmm. always do the volumes whichever the one it was in the late 80s okay uh that iteration i think it was three i think you're right yeah that sounds right so that was probably the iteration i read the most yeah i didn't read it really a whole lot i remember I remember one summer my cousin and i were reading wizard and we saw the the you know what if um what if hulk killed wolverine Mm-hmm. issue which had like a foil cover of like of like yeah. the adamantium skeleton like like in a right. cemetery and it looked really really cool and and you know for us being you know 10 and 11 right like that's just the coolest freaking thing so you know oh, we, of course we begged to go to a comic store like that day and, and you know <laughs> went and looked for it so that was a big one for us um but uh no i didn't really dabble with it with it a whole whole lot um mm. you know i i i like with a lot of things, I, I I mean, I guess like, you know, some concepts I think were better than others and I think lend themselves to like, wow, that's really, really provocative and really interesting. And other mm-hmm. ones are just sort of, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I'll skip that one. It's one, <laughs> it's one of those things where like, I, I it's it's interesting to me to go back and like think about issues that I read when I was younger because I, I never picked up, I didn't pick up what if regularly. I picked it up as it's, if the story interests me, I'm like, well, that sounds cool. I'll pick that one up or, mm. you know, had to do with the X-Men or something that I was into at the time or Spider-Man. I had a lot of Spider-Man what ifs. But one of the ones that just thinking about modern day comics, what I thought was interesting was um, you have the uh, it's I can't remember the name. it's 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 one of the ones with the Hulk, but around the time of Planet Hulk and, and World War Hulk and all that stuff, it had the bit of Hulk basically being kind of kind of savage or barbaric. Okay, long hmm. before, <laughs> long <laughs> long before the um, well these two storylines it was good like there's you know there's it's, it's a good one but it's one of those that were, i remember as a kid going when i first saw world war hulk i'm like oh they're doing that story finally in the mainstream stuff but the biggest one i could think of that was what if number 10 of the original run of volume one okay which is um yeah what if jane foster had found the hammer of thor uh, okay <laughs> so long again long before we get the mighty thor in right. the comics and this is like 1977 yeah there's basically it, when in the original origin with Don Blake, uh, Jane Foster is the one who found to be worthy and, and, and wields Mjolnir. Um, but she has a costume much more like the original costume from the Thor war, just not like um, her, the one that they came up with her for the Jason Aaron run. Hmm. So yeah, there was stuff that's in what if that eventually would kind of filter every now and then it would filter into the main, main uh, Marvel universe depending. Right. Yeah, yeah. It does surprise me modern day that marvel publishing marvel doesn't go to this well more often i'm surprised too i really am right like i think because because i mean when you get down to it i think the appeal of these stories is kind of getting uh uh, a twist on something that's that's really familiar right Mm -hmm. and 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 getting sort of the freedom as as a creator to write a little bit unencumbered by by continuity or what the character would is expected to do in a certain situation Mm. Right. And I think like that's to me when the appeal of these books and these stories like really, really mesh and become interesting. Right. Mm. Is like, what can I get that's 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 a story that we wouldn't get normally or we couldn't get normally. Right. And with all the. I mean, like, I mean, it's a definition of of just a continuity free book today. Right. You know, I mean, sure. Well, they did. I mean, they did it for a regular book for at least like uh, Clifton was saying, there was about three volumes of it that ran, you know, uh, at least, you know, 20, 30, 40 issues. Right. And then they started to just do a lot of one shots or what ifs around events. Yeah. Yeah. Volume three ran much longer than I thought it did. It ran 1989 through 1998. Okay. Yeah. Much longer than. Okay. Yeah. That's much longer than I thought. 114 issues. Okay. There you uh, go. In, in volume three and just volume three, which is the iteration I started. Mm hmm. And I do remember uh, some of the ones, a lot of them were about events that were happening at the time. Like right. they would do an event and then like soon after they would be like, what if that event ended in another way? Right. <laughs> right. It was kind of just a continuation of the right. events like Inferno yeah. and Evolutionary yeah. War, Armor Wars. Yeah. Those are all ones I see early on in uh, volume three. But then there's issues like what if Daredevil killed the Kingpin, mm-hmm. yeah. which goes back to the Born Again story. And then there's, uh, number 10 of, of that volume, that run of what if is what if the Punisher's family hadn't been killed? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're fun, like thought provoking ideas. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I think for me, the approach that, that, that I would do today, if anybody cared or asked me, is um, I would take the Batman like black and white kind of approach where like mm-hmm. every couple you know like every couple of years dc dust this off and you get sure. like a new series of of you know four issues or six series six issues of of batman black and white which is like sort of like a, a short anthology story but but it's predicated a lot on the sort of like hotshot creators coming in and hotshot pairings mm-hmm. of this writer this artist doing you know and it's and it's it, and i imagine it's got to be a little bit like you got a batman story you want you want to tell like in eight pages Right. I would kind of take that model and just sort of be like, you know, every couple of years do like a what if anthology book that goes on for six issues, eight issues and fill it up with just like hot shot pairings of, you know, not necessarily tie it to, to anything going on at the moment. It mm-hmm. can if it want. I think that that's kind of the beauty of it is it can sort of be whatever it wants. Sure. Oh, yeah. And I don't really feel that they take that they take full advantage of it. No, no. Think- but that said, to argue with myself on that, the fact that they don't take full advantage of it, I do think makes it special every time it comes around. Yeah. Well, I mean, I you think know? I think if you offered, like you said, offer up to to you know bigger artists or bigger writers and said, hey, listen, surely there's something you want to do that you wanted to see. Think about think about it this way: the entire oh, the entire catalog is yours. You can go to do whatever you want. Yeah. We're gonna open up the floor to you. Do whatever you want to do. Wh- whatever story you thought should have ended a different way, go write that story. Go draw that story. And I think that would fill a bunch of books for a while i think that wouldn't be a problem so but yeah so that so um that's comics what if and then like i said they've had they've had other um other marvel stuff that was that was um parallel world or multiversal but like i said not quite i think listen did you put it they like to dabble they don't really like to um get into it until about i'd say hickman jonathan hickman stuff like on fantastic four mm-hmm. um definitely on his avengers stuff um but like fantastic four you had uh the council of reeds right where you had you know all the reeds from different from uh different parallel worlds or the multiverse get together um and, and this is a comic run fantastic four what like 10 12 years ago yeah by jonathan hickman um i can't remember the artist on it but that was one, and then, like I said, when Avengers came about, we get the concept of stuff that we're starting to see in the MCU now, with their multiversal stuff, which is like incursions. Like incursions all comes from Hickman's uh, run, where you have a, a character like I believe, yeah, the Black Swan was a character that basically showed up almost like Harbinger in, in DC's uh, Christ on Infinite Earth says basically, you know, there are two worlds that are going to occupy the same space. Mm-hmm. Either one of those worlds are going to, one or both of those worlds will be destroyed. And you can basically try, if, you, if you're willing to destroy the other Earth first, your world will be spared. Right. Like, that whole thing. And we get one a little of you's got to go. <laughs> right. But we get a little of that in Crisis. At one point in Crisis, spoiler alert, there's a point where the, the multiverse gets winnowed down into to a, a finite amount of Earths. And they're slowly starting to integrate, and you're having timelines and dinosaurs on the on the on the tame and tames and uh, you know there's all this stuff happening where all these timelines converge, and the heroes have to figure a way to split these Earths apart without destroying everything. Um, it's similar to that at Marvel when Hickman puts this together for um, what eventually leads into his Secret Wars, uh, the idea that um, you know incursions are basically like you said, one of them's got to go. Right. But I, I think I remember commenting to the time to uh, Tommy when Tom and I were reading it as it was coming out, the idea that Hickman was basically trying to do crisis at Marvel. And it yeah. works like it's yeah. a really good story. It, it works. Definitely. He's got a story to tell. And, and, and I like it a lot. And I, I certainly won't spoil anything for anyone who hasn't read it for especially mm. when you want to see it, whatever they're going to pull for the MCU. Right. A lot of what's in that storyline will be uh, cherry picked. I'm sure for what's coming up in an MCU, because as we've seen through um, like multiverse madness and spider verse, um, what else am I missing? No way home. No way home. Loki. Right. Loki. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, speaking of spider verse, it was a, a, before I forget that at one point, Marvel had something called the ultimate universe. They were always trying to find a way to incorporate miles Morales into the main Marvel universe. <laughs> 616. Right. And again, it's one of those things that, that, you know, gets gets handled <laughs> with Hickman. I won't spoil that for you either. Okay. But it seems that Marvel is, you know, we as as we're getting into the stuff with Kang and and the multiverse threat, the MCU is 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 headed towards um, 
you know, having to deal with the fact that, that there's going to be incursions, right? We've set up the premise in, in, um, multiverse, multiverse of madness. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Multiverse of madness. It's interesting to me that the MCU is doing a setting up kind of like this secret war crisis event mm-hmm. out of desire that they want to. And that's the story that they want to tell as opposed to like an editorial housekeeping thing yeah. that we want to do. Right. right. We're, we're like we were saying with DC, DC tends to, you know, we, we, you know, uh, we, we make a mess of things. we got to clean it up every once in a while. So a crisis comes and sort of, uh, uh, you know, runs a comb through, through their established, <laughs> right. you know, multiverse and continuity and everything. And I'm convinced, I mean, so like we were saying with Jonathan Hickman's Secret War, I'm convinced that, I mean, that 90% of the motivation for that story was to get Miles Morales in, oh, the, I don't know. in the Marvel yeah. Universe proper. I, sure. think, I think they wanted to do that and built mm-hmm. an event to justify it, I in, in my right. personal opinion. I haven't read that anywhere, or anything, but I mean, that's just how I feel. I wouldn't. I can't it. argue with you because I, I think that's absolutely true. And so, there, I mean, there's there's something interesting about the fact that you know there, there's there's nothing in the MCU that's going like like this thing is out of hand. Right. Uh, uh, this thing is confusing. Boy, your continuity has become a mess. Right. Nothing like that, right? There's the, there's there's no right. There's no character from like a TV show randomly that they want to like <laughs> incorporate and right and have stick around. Yeah. Although you can argue Netflix, we won't go there. Uh, anyway. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Right. <laughs> but it's like, but it just seems to be like, like they, they want to tell that story just out of like, out of pure desire of, of, we think that that would be something cool to see on the big screen. And I think that that's interesting uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> to me when there's not an ulterior motive to it. Well, I, I think know. the only, the only ulterior motive that I, that I can see other than, you know, possibly getting a live action miles, which again, it'd be interesting if that's what the ploy is to try and make it happen. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all over again on the big screen is I, I think that um, I think after, especially the way that this, this phase has been received and, and executed, I think a lot of their plan is we're going to do this. And, you know, that's the thing about a, a, a multiversal crisis or, um, or a par- you know, when these things happen, usually it's done because you need to hit the reset button. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think the reset button in this instance is, wouldn't it be great to have another Iron Man? <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great to have another Captain America? Not Sam right. Wilson, but another Captain mm. America that's Steve Rogers. And then we can tell Sam Wilson stories and Steve Rogers stories together or vice versa. Or, or you know, that's that I think is what the, well, the other thing I also think is, you know, they like to have, you know, everybody starting, you know, your Fantastic Fours, your X-Men's, your Avengers all be in the same timeline, starting from the same starting point as opposed to, we have to acquire worlds like DC did. Like we have to bring in the Fawcett universe and right. um, crisis. Uh, I forgot to mention this crisis is bringing in the Charlton characters like Blue Beetle and Captain Adam and uh, Peter Cannon, Thunderbolt and Nightshade and all these characters sort of got brought in at crisis, right? That's like some of the first appearance of those characters in DC continuity is when they acquired the Charlton characters were able to use them. Um, but it's similar for this for where Marvel with the 20th century Fox deal where they, you know, acquired all the characters that Fox had like X-Men and Fantastic Four and Deadpool right. that now that are, they would like to have them, you know, when they start their next, when they restart the universe to have everything sort of be, you know, I'm sure when that, when we get to the secret wars and whatever the Kang dynasty is now going to be called, whoever's going to be the villain, um, unless they recast Kang. <laughs> um, I'm sure when that starter gun goes off for the, for the epilogue bit, that teaser bit is going to be, you know, you know, all the heroes in New York that we haven't had in the Baxter building and Avengers mansion and, and out in, in, uh, what is it? Westchester where the X-Men right, live. X mansion. Yeah. Salem right. center. We're going to get some kind of pan throughout the Marvel universe to let you know. Yeah. They're all, you know, gangs all here. Everyone's <laughs> here now. There is no more of like, you know, the universe are split apart and all that stuff. So I think that's there. I think that impetus is there for them to do it along with the fact that they can smash together anything they want. Right. So that's all the speculation about where MCU might be going right. out of multiversal stuff is a, a reboot of sorts. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's just speculation. I know we part of the impetus for doing this episode was the fact that um, uh, Zach went on a rant um, in our group text 
I did. Right. Not on the show. No. Because when we're not doing the show, we're having these same conversations like while we're all at work. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, not <laughs> a, in our chats. When we're yeah. free from when doing we're free, actual like, work. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> on we, our lunch break. Have, on our right, lunch break. Of course, of course. Yeah. On our, yeah, our <laughs> mandated 15 minute coffee break. Yeah, Absolutely. Yes. Go, go unions. When we're, when anyway, we have these, you know, we have, we see, you know, we see alerts, we send each other, you know, links to stuff. We send each other pictures of stuff to say, Hey, did you guys see this? What do you think of this? You know, this is something, you know, but we, I don't remember what set you off, Zach. What was that set you off? <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know exactly. It was what the I, Deadpool trailer. Wasn't that's it? That's what it was. Oh, no, it was Deadpool. Yes. Which we haven't <laughs> talked about yet. So. No, we haven't. No. And so, and, and, and I haven't seen the Deadpool movies just because. Right. Just because the character itself kind of like he kind of annoys me. I find that I honestly I was when I when you when you type that I was shocked and I don't mean it from a standard of like oh you can't believe it like you know you know why is it taking you so long to see it which is usually what we say yeah um but no for me it was just I, I mean I, I don't I, I didn't love the second one I saw it initially it's grown on me and I like it more I love the first one. Mm. And I'm not a huge Deadpool guy. Like I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I like the character, but I'm not. You know, I, I would never point to a stack of my of comics in my collection and be like, "These are my Deadpools." You know, <laughs> love the costume. Yeah, love the it's costume. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a lot of fun. You know, one of the best comic accurate costumes I think in in the history of comic book movies. I think. Yeah. I th- you know from what I've seen, I think I think Deadpool and Ryan Reynolds is a is a character actor. Uh, uh, a marriage that it that, yeah. that you know is just it just works beautifully. Eventually, mm-hmm. there was stuff that well, yeah, eventually, I said eventually. Uh, eventually, <laughs> yeah. you are right. Yes, <laughs> yes. So it took a while. It took a little while. Right. No yeah. fault of his. No fault of his. No fault of his. <laughs> no, no. It was a writer strike for X Men Origins Wolverine. That's what we're referring to. But, um, right. but yeah, I was asking you guys about something that I saw in the th- in the trailer. I was <laughs> That's like. Right. That's right. Now I, I was like, is there, coming back. It, like, like, is this stuff like, is this like playing off of stuff from the first two movies or is this yeah. sort of just stuff that coming out of like left field? Right. Is it, is it, is, is, is this ham handed? Is this not, you know, is this being forced into a frame that doesn't work? Right. And I, and I was like, I was like, oh yeah, that makes, you know, I, I'd heard rumors of what it could be about. Mm. Um, and then when you see the trailer, I was like, oh, of course, well, that makes perfect sense because of the way the, fr- the, the second movie is. Right. Now, I, mind you, I don't. And Clifton, you can say you can tell me if I'm wrong on this. I don't think um, it was intentional. They had any clue this was going to where it was going to go. It's just a happy accident. I haven't seen the trailer. I should watch the trailer. You haven't oh. seen the trailer either. <laughs> wow, I've seen okay. the movies. Hold on, pause, pause, pause. I'll watch the trailer. I was like, I meant to. I meant to watch it before we started. Okay, hold on, That's hold on, fine. hold on. I'm watching the trailer. I forgot who I was dealing with. Okay, so let uh, me. So now, having seen the trailer, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let, let, let me try and, and more succinctly set up my my thought. Okay, okay. So after I saw the the trailer for Deadpool three, I having not seen the first two, I couldn't help but feel that like. If I was a fan of the first two movies, I might be a little mad that the third movie was taking such a detour to this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. and if I'm being, and if I'm being really honest with myself, as much as I really like no way home, I feel this way kind of about no way home. Right. Right. Where I'm just sort of like, I kind of wish you just gave me a a real Spider-Man three instead Mm -hmm. of like, instead of uh, like muddying it up with, with, you know, as cool as it is to see, you know, everybody in there and, and, um, and they do tie it back to like the theme of the movie where like, you know, it, it, you know, it still counts and, and some poignant stuff happens and everything. But, you know, like I said, like, I kind of wish that we didn't waste time on it, on the other stuff. <laughs> you know? Right. I think you, I think you said that you would trade no way home any day of the week for an actual, just MCU <laughs> spider for a yeah. third Spider-Man True. movie. Right. Still feel right. that way. And again, and I, Right. And I, and I, I, my thing is they don't have it down. I mean, there's, for me, it's, it's the problem of, well, your friendly neighborhood Spider Man, stay close to the ground, Tony Stark speech in the first one, and then you take him into space. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Like there's not, you, it's hard to reconcile the two of those, you know, those two extremes. Yeah. You know, and I agree. With Deadpool's you. like as safe a character, they think, because the character does like this kind of weird stuff all the time. 
And so, mm-hmm. and so maybe if, if you're a fan of that world that like, maybe this isn't such a, so out of the left field or anything, but I feel right. like that, that is what I was going to say. Like coming in, like I, I'm not a Deadpool fan in the comics, mm. but I did enjoy the first, well, I enjoyed the first movie a lot. The second movie to a point less so right. than the first one, but I liked the first one a lot. Yeah. And second one is okay. Yeah. Uh, but like, I imagine, you know, the, the fans of Deadpool, like if you're a fan of them, like you're honestly going to eat this stuff up right. because like, that's, that's what Deadpool is. Deadpool is like the crazy fourth wall breaking now, fourth wall breaking, like, you know, meta and like the more meta, the better right. for, mm-hmm. for probably a lot of Deadpool fans. Right. I imagine. Yeah. It was just, and, and this is going about as meta as it can get. My, my rant, I think had less to do with what they're doing for that movie. And more right. of the mm-hmm. fact that it's yet again, we're getting an actor coming back who was in something else, right? Mm-hmm. By way of, of multiverse explanation that this exists too. Yeah. And at this point, it's been so many times this has happened that I'm kind of over right. it. It's certainly <laughs> a trope now. It is certainly a trope of multiverse pop culture now. Yeah. Right. To... You know, like we were talking about with the CWs, the CW Crisis on Infinite Earths, bringing back Ashley Scott from the 2003 mm-hmm. Birds of Prey show or 2002. I can't even remember, remember what year it was. I think 2003 Birds of Prey show. And, and uh, that's become the thing. Yeah, like it's always right. now a vehicle to bring back that person you remember from that thing before. Yeah, right. And And yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with you to a point where like that trope when that's all there is, it's like, yeah, like it's kind of cool. Like it was, it was really cool, you know, once or twice. And then it (laughs) was kind of cool after that. And then, and then it's there a lot after that. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, and, and just in like the, the, the scope of multiversal storytelling to be like, it's the multiverse. It's a, you know, infinite, realm of possibilities or like a world of a, you know, a realm of infinite possibilities. Now here's that one thing you saw that one time yeah. again, I agree. like that's yeah. all we're going to give the you. The first time it was impressive because it's like, Oh wow. Like they pulled it off. They got everybody back. Like, mm-hmm. I mean like re- really if we're, if we're, if we're uh, splitting hairs, like X-Men days of future past when they brought like the two like mm-hmm. cast together, you know, the, right. That was kind of like, wow, they pulled it off. They got everybody back for it. That's really kind of cool. And, and, and it just sort of like, and, and, uh, I'm going to be very honest. Like, I think the problem's me. Uh, <laughs> like nobody else. Like I just, for whatever right. reason, I don't have that. Like you guys know, I, 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 you know, strong history, right? Strong history. Uh, well-documented. I love Batman 89. Mm-hmm. I don't have that in me to get excited for like, Oh, Michael Keaton's coming back when right. it's been so long. I just like, okay, I don't care why. Right. Right. Cause I get also kind of like when I watch like that flash trailer I'm looking at, I'm like, but that's not the version we got. Right. Like that's not it. Like you're changing it. Like that guy's like, like superhuman compared to the movie that we saw. So mm. why am I excited for this? Mm. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. It's not you guys. It's me. Oh, right. I know. No, I know. <laughs> I, I, as I said in my text at the time, I'm like, well, this is a, this is a good time to jump off because <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be more of that. They're, they're, we're not done. They're, I mean, part of the problem again, and, and we've talked about this before, and I, I was thinking about that as we were gearing up for this and talking about this whole aspect of it was, I, again, I, I think that that it's just this this phase has been the slow burn of slow burns, but I you know I, I also think that people don't remember how long it took to get to Endgame, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. And I and I think everyone wants you know I think that's the biggest complaint that I keep seeing in in threads and in comments from people not not with us I'm just saying in general people saying you know uh, it should have ended with Endgame I'm like but that's not you know we're it's sequential storytelling month to month for since the 60s it's not stopping you're not you're not going to stop it just because they wrapped up Endgame right um, they're not done um, and it's still they're still you know I, as much as I, it's been a mixed bag and I've loved some stuff in this phase and some stuff I haven't and you know a lot of it has been out of their hands with COVID and the death of Chadwick Boseman and, you know, a lot of other things that just hit the, the writer strike, the actor strike, yeah. all that stuff hit them, you know, you know, hit them hard. You know, they, they, they you don't, how can you repair for all those things? Um, I do think that people are just tired and I think they mm-hmm. want their, you know, they're tired of waiting for their, their meal to come. 
right. I think their order, you know, they put their order in after Endgame and they're still waiting and waiting. But again, you know, it, it, I keep telling them, you know, the people that, that, that complain to me about it that I know that, that don't follow comics religiously or don't know this stuff like we do. I'm like, you know, I, you have no idea what it's like to wait for a month to month comic then. I mean, <laughs> right. you just have no idea. Like my endurance for this stuff is like, I'm fine with it. They'll get to it. But I think the general populace is just not there. I just right. think they're having, they're a little burnt out on the idea of like uh, another multiversal story when it could be. Well, I mean, I, don't know. Else- I think, I think superhero fatigue is real. I don't, I don't eh. feel it in that same way. I, eh. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know that it's talked about in the best way to be perfectly honest, because I just think, I just I'm think not it's tired a- of these movies. I'm not well, tired no. of them at all. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of that kind of story. I'm tired. I'm tired of, sure. of, 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 I'm tired of the old franchise actors coming back mm-hmm. to make that story count. Right. To be like, oh, it, all, it all mattered. And that's not important to me at this juncture. And, and so, so I don't have the fatigue in that way, but mm-hmm. I do think that it's, I, I, I do think that it's gotten hard to follow because there's so much more of it mm-hmm. with the advent of the TV. Right. Stuff. So what you, so what you're saying is you would have hated the idea of Jay Garrick and the justice society coming back because we don't need those stories to matter to Barry Allen. Because those stories right. coming back and those characters coming back. I, that's the- I would have hated it if it was the fourth time we got it. Okay. <laughs> but, gotcha. because, but because we got, uh, you know, Across the Spider-Verse had mm-hmm. nuggets of this, No Way Home, then mm-hmm. Flash. That, and I'm just like, all right, enough already. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Because, like, it's... it's it's a, and, and you want to know what else it is? It's a little bit of this. I'm also kind of over Easter eggs because I got to mm-hmm. a point where I feel like Easter eggs are dictating a little too much story. And mm-hmm. now it just feels like that we're at a moment where like an Easter egg is now dictating an entire film. Mm-hmm. It's the basis for an entire film. How do right. we get Tobey Maguire? How do we get Al- Andrew Garfield? And how do we get, you know, uh, Tom Holland all in the same movie? Right. How uh, do we get Al- Alfred we Molina go. and so on right? and so on? Right. No, I got you. Yeah. And so, like, when you brought this up, though, like, I was kind of in the middle because I do, like, I do feel like, yeah, it's that that bit, that bit is overdone. Um, uh, how many times you're going to have that actor from a thing 20 years ago? A surprise, here they are again. <laughs> like, it can only go so far. But yeah, like, as as Frank pointed out, like, the in, in that conversation, in our phone conversation or chat conversation we had <laughs> when this all came up, like, yeah, those those comics, when I think about it analytically, like when you like critically, it is the that is the equivalent of what the comics were doing, where they bring back like the golden age version of the character. You're just dealing with fictional characters instead of instead of actual actors. Mm. Right. But but yeah, like that is what the trope is, is like Crisis on Infinite Earths was all those pre-existing characters. And and you get a few new additions in crisis on infinite earths where like oh we didn't see you know that version of of this character before but you know 90 percent of it was all things that were seen before Mm -hmm. so i do also understand like oh yeah that is where this stuff is coming from because like it's drawing from the comics and and it's just translating that trope into a hollywood version of that trope which is bring back the familiar actor from that previous iteration so I'm kind of in the middle on it. I can see both. I can see both ways on it. You know where I stand. <laughs> <laughs> Frank you know, loves it. He I do. Loves it, 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 right? It's a throwback. Again, it's a throwback <laughs> to what I loved when I was a kid of like, oh, wow, we're going to, you know, the, you know, one character is great. 45 characters uh, of superheroes that I, that I don't know about or know about in a book or story. I'm like, bring them on. Right. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention when I, when I bring it back to the idea of, of Jay Garrick and the, the JSA reappearing was. In the early comics of the Silver Age, right, it was really important to show that after all the Wortham and scare tactics of how comics were for juvenile delinquents um, and the burning of comics and, and all that kind of stuff, there was a point where DC especially was like, we got to put some kind of science in our books, right? Yeah. You know, especially in the Flash. You had the Flash facts, right? And yeah. I have no proof. And I have, <laughs> I have no proof whatsoever of this. Like, I can't tell you that this is why this happened. But in 1956, a guy by the name of Hugh Everett completes his PhD thesis in, 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 uh, and he titled it The Relative State Formulation of Quantum Mechanics, which basically became the many worlds interpretation or the theory of parallel worlds, right? And I know a lot of, like, a lot of the guys at DC, like I remember when you look at those old books, 
uh, especially the Flash. I know they're in some other, like Justice League and other things, but you do get these scientific, you know, panels that explains like this is how the Flash is able to run at the speed of light, stuff like that. Right. So I don't know if there's any kind of correlation. I can't remember between. I couldn't find a copy to read before we did this of the Flash of Two Worlds. But for all I know, the multiverse comes from this guy, for DC at least, from Hugh Everett, and his idea that. There was more than one idea. It looks like his whole thing was, as he looked at Schrodinger's experiment, that it's not you can't just say the cat is alive or dead. There's so many other branching ideas, and as a result, multiple worlds. So that was something I did want to mention. I forgot to mention we were talking about the DC stuff at the beginning. Mm, okay. So with we as we wrap up, um, do you guys have any lightning? We do a lightning round of stuff that we liked, multiversal or uh, parallel worlds, where we where we think it's like well done. Yeah, just kind of like yeah. you, like you really like. I love this parallel world story because of this, or I love this multiple uh, multiversal story because of this. Yeah, I, I I have I have a bit where I'll argue with myself. Okay, with this, where like it's a, it's an early early instance of like the like old actors coming back that I appreciate. I thought it was kind of cool. So in two thousand nine, they did a, a TV movie called Turtles Forever. Okay, and this was this was like the finale for the. 2003 Ninja Turtle series that was on Fox that, that not a whole lot of people watched. Mm. But in this TV movie, what had happened is that they they met up with the turtles from the 1987 cartoon, mm. right? And 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 um, you know, it's and, it, and it's very crisis scene and everything, and it ultimately builds up to like you you meet the turtles prime and they have like a Mirage Studio 1984 style mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, right. sequence with like you know very Frank Millery sounding Ninja Turtles. Um, <laughs> right, you know, right. meeting meeting the ones from eighty seven and two thousand three. I really, really liked that, and thought it was kind of daring and cool for that time. The drawback to that was the eighty seven turtles were kind of kind of jokes. They were I mean, they weren't really like treated with like any real respect. They were just kind of goofy and silly, and um, they all had the same personality and stuff. And and the key is that the that the voice actors did not all come back for that. Ah, uh, okay. So then. Fast forward to Nickelodeon gets Ninja Turtles, buys Ninja Turtles, does their CGI series. It started in 2012. That mm. goes five seasons. Well, in season five, in the last season, they basically do Turtles Forever again. Okay. Verbatim, like <laughs> okay. the same thing. But they do it better because th- in this instance, they they did manage to get like all of the original voice actors to come back. You got to see some neat stuff where where the um the 87 Turtles got to appear in the cg style that was the show and then vice versa you got to see like our turtles from that series in 2d animation style okay and like what would that look like so they mixed the styles up really really and they also did like the mirage bit which was done in still frame Mm -hmm. stuff which i didn't like like quite as much as the original turtles forever but even though the still frame made sense within the show because the show did flashbacks all in like black and white still frame. It was a very mirage art style. Right. So for all the uh, uh, yammering I was doing about how I don't like this, <laughs> this is right. an instance, this is an instance where I like, I really enjoyed it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And you did leave out one thing they, they did in that one is that Rob Paulson was the voice of a 1987 turtle and a 2012 turtle. Oh, wow. yes. Different exactly. turtles. Mm, so in exactly. that episode, he gets to play 1987 Raphael. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yep. And 2012 Donatello in the yep. same scenes together. That's cool. So that yep. was like a little extra, a little extra meta level to it. And then, and then in one more instance for that too, which, which James Avery, who did the voice of Shredder in the 87 had, had passed away by this point. Mm-hmm. And so what you got is Kevin Michael Richardson who voices the Shredder in the 2012 series, also voicing 87 Shredder, talking like James Avery, basically, okay. like Uncle Phil. <laughs> that's cool. Which is really cool, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really well done, I think. So that that's certainly one of them that, that you know, uh, stood out to me, uh, where this these multiverse stories are kind of cool. Nice. I do like me some Kevin Michael Richardson. <laughs> He's very good. Clifton, what about you? Mine will, I mean, come as no surprise since I talk about it all the time. <laughs> and that is Spider-Verse. Mm-hmm. But I will bring up first the comic Spider-Verse. So before the movies, but after the video game, because apparently like the one of the initial Spider-Verse things was uh, Spider-Man Shattered Dimension, the video game. Mm-hmm. Right. 
uh, which actually kind of birthed a lot of this stuff. Cause you, you prior to this had in the comics, you have kind of like what if stories you had, you had kind of like Marvel alternate reality stories, like their noir universe. Mm-hmm. And that's where you did first get a Spider-Man noir, which I think was in the you know early to mid two thousands. And then that video game came out around 2010, if I'm remembering right. I'm just trying to guess off the top of my head. It sounds about right. Yeah, sometime in the late 2000s. Uh, and that did incorporate Spider-Man Noir plus previous two other versions of Spider-Man. Was it 2099, I think, and, and a regular Spider-Man? I'm trying to remember for sure. Yeah, I believe it's, Sp- it's Spider-Man, Spider-Man Noir, uh, Miguel O'Hara, 20, Spider-Man 2099, and right. I can't, can't remember the last one. Yeah, so that video game is kind of what birthed it all, incidentally. And I think Dan Slott did have some involvement in that game or a later game. I possibly will verify that. But in that game, they didn't quite interact. It was like you would play different segments as different ones, but there wasn't a whole lot of interaction in the storyline, in the different worlds. And then that is what Dan Slott took six years later, I would say. No, four years later, four years later. Around 2014, you get basically the introduction to the Spider Verse in the comics, mm-hmm. and that starts with a mini series called Edge of Spider Verse, mm-hmm. and that is the introduction to, I mean, some of the other ones, but the big one is issue two, Edge of Spider Verse number two, is the introduction of Spider Gwen, Gwen Stacy, mm-hmm. and that was a big moment for me. Like I, I like I love Spider Man. I've talked about Spider Man's my favorite character, my favorite superhero on here before. Uh, just growing up, like that was the the first thing that got me into comics. And then, but for some reason, just like latching on and seeing like more good stories come out of characters in that world and be like, what could have happened with other Spider-Man characters, especially a character like Gwen Stacy, who is known for dying (laughs) in the comics. Yeah. And, and the other times they had brought her back or had tried to do stories with her before. I won't mention because they're not, they're not great. <laughs> like other times they tried to do more with Gwen Stacy and mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it got bad fast. Yeah. But so this is the first time when, when an alternate reality got us something I thought was great where I was like, yeah, like, like Gwen Stacy's a good character. Like that Gwen Stacy, we've still got her story. We still got what it means to, to Peter, to our universe is Peter, the tragedy that, that it means to him. And now, You get like this alternate version where you can explore this character and what could have been. And it's simply the question, again, like kind of coming out of what if of like, what if she was bitten by the radioactive spider instead of Peter Parker? It's a simple premise and and you can extrapolate it in a whole different way, which they have since done, Mm -hmm. Uh, not just in that comic, but now in the movies as well. Uh, So, yeah, that one, Edge of Spider-Verse, the introduction of the Spider-Verse into the comics. is 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 one of my favorite things of multiverse storytelling. Excellent. I'm late to the party on this one. I only just got to recently see this film, and it's mm-hmm. one of those where uh, our good friend Tommy liked to chastise me for not seeing it sooner. <laughs> he's like, I had to sit on this forever. Why didn't you see it sooner? And I'm like, I'm busy. And he's like, you get the things you want to get to. And I'm like, you're right. Um, <laughs> I finally got to watch. Uh, it's like he's on the episode right now. I know. It's like he's here with us in the room. Not once. Um, not once, Tommy, for yes and twice for no. Uh, he had recommended to me and other people had as well. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. Um, I don't believe. Has everyone seen it? I have, yes. No, I haven't. I won't spoil it for you because it's, f- it's a phenomenal film. I loved it. <laughs> um, uh, all the performances are great. All the production stuff is great. Uh, it, I... Recently, when I was on vacation around Christmas time, visiting some family, I was flying to South America and uh, it was available. I could have watched it, in, it around December, January, but I didn't want to experience it that way. I figured I'd wait till I could watch it in, in the comfort of my home on a big screen. And it had the, the premise, the, the line, it only had one line description and it said, an exhausted woman is unable to finish her taxes. <laughs> and i said no that's not what this is about at all and it's not um it's such a great thing of with all the other stuff that's going on with spider-verse and multiverse of madness and no way home and um all this this you know uh multiversal stuff in in, in the zeitgeist and in, in pop culture um this one was like i i, I it's just so good 
uh, uh, Michelle Yeoh is great. Uh, Kiki Kwan is great. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis is great. Nobody in it's terrible. I forget too. Stephanie, um, what's her name? Sue. Sue, fantastic as well. Yeah, H H S U. Right, I think. Right, yeah. I believe that's how it's pronounced. But yeah, wonderful cast, wonderfully written. Um, beautiful examples of how the multiverse works. Yeah, I I can't recommend it enough. It's just so good and poignant and funny and bizarre in parts. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it again getting back we didn't talk much about rick and morty but it, it reminded me of the same sort of stuff from that you could see in a rick and morty where it, it swings from being nearly if you know being offensive and being uh, just bizarre and then back to like having a real heart and poignancy at its 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 at its core right um yeah this is one where i was saying before like you know some of the multiverse stories like promise you infinite possibilities and yes. then show you just this one thing this mm-hmm. is one that 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 gives you the infinite possibility mm-hmm. Where you're like, how did you possibly even come up with this? Right. And yeah, why? This, but it's you're promising me a universe where anything's possible. So there it is. Yeah. This this one laughs at Multiverse of Madness um, <laughs> for the amount of choices you get. Like Multiverse of Madness is like the uh, the Seven Eleven of the multiverse, <laughs> whereas this is I don't know the biggest the biggest mall you can think of. I mean, right. it's it's so much like the choices that are made and. The stuff that you get, I, I only saw it recently. I plan to see it again and, sl- and slow stuff down so I can watch it. But yeah, great movie. Just really, really good. Yeah. So what's funny about that, comparing it to Multiverse of Madness, mm-hmm. is everything everywhere all at once. I think it, I'm looking at its release date. It was March 25th, but I think that was limited release. And I think okay. it had it lived in the theaters a bit in, in, smaller, in smaller theaters. And then in April... Like towards the end of April, I think it got uh, an IMAX push actually mm. and showed up on IMAX screens uh, towards the end of April or sometime in April. Mm-hmm. But I went uh, the first week of May with our with our engineer, mm-hmm. our engineer bot, and I went to the to the theater and saw it in IMAX. I think it was on a Wednesday. I okay. think it was Wednesday, May fifth or May, Wednesday, May fourth. Sorry, mm. and then. Uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness <laughs> came out on May 5th, Thursday ah, okay. night, May 5th. So we saw them like pretty much back to back right? Uh, in the same theater. And, and and I know he was saying, like, and I like Multiverse of Madness too, but I think our engineer, I think, also likes Multiverse of Madness, but he's like, yeah, it wasn't even the best multiverse film I saw this week. Right. <laughs> right. No, not even close. I mean, I, I really like I really like Multiverse of Madness, but yeah, this is this this <laughs> destroys it from that <laughs> standpoint of, you know, your bang for your buck. So, yeah. uh, yeah, highly recommend it. If you've not seen it, like I said, I'm not going to ruin it for you. Like I said, it's about, a uh, an exhausted lady who can't finish your taxes and the multiverse. <laughs> so it goes, you know, it's on Netflix currently. You can definitely see it there if you're, if you're looking for a place to watch it, but, uh, just a, ah, what a good movie, man. Yeah. So, all right. I think that's it. Unless we have anything else lightning around. Anything else we want to say? Any other choices? I do have more, but we were, I feel like it's long. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's I'm, sure right. the, I'm sure the people listening are, are, are wanting us to wrap it up. We can always revisit this one. This is always a good one. The multiverse is infinite. So therefore, you know, we can always come back. All right. So as we wrap up, if you want to suggest a topic, let us know in the comments, you can email us at info at let me know how it is.com. We're also available on blue sky. Reminder, you can find links, examples for everything we talk about on LetMeKnowHowItIs.com, where you can check out all our past episodes. Just please, however you do find us, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review and follow us on social media. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.